to another in our series of live performances from the stages of Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts in New York City. I'm Fred Child. Tonight, we're at the New York City Opera, where we're preparing for Giacomo Puccini's Madama Butterfly. Based on the drama by David Belasco, with a libretto by Giuseppe Giacosa and Luigi Illica. Music director George Manahan is our conductor tonight. The production director is Mark Lemos, stage direction by David Grabarkowitz. The set is designed by Michael Jurgen, with costumes by Constance Hoffman, and lighting by Robert Wirzel. This performance features the New York City Opera Orchestra and Chorus, and is being broadcast live from the New York State Theater at Lincoln Center. Now, backstage, here's our host, the great American mezzo-soprano, Susan Graham. It's a thrill to be able to welcome you to Lincoln Center tonight on this blustery evening. You can feel that spring is around the corner, and you can definitely sense that something special is about to happen right here in the State Theater. But let me give you fair warning. If you have an objection to being swept off your feet by beauty, you may be in the wrong place. There aren't too many things in this world more gorgeous than Puccini's Madama Butterfly. Opera is one way for us to find the magic in our lives. Endlessly fabulous melodies you can't stop humming will do that. In a few minutes, even people who are seeing it for the first time will be saying, I know this tune. Puccini knew this story was operatic gold the very first time he came across it. But what most people don't know is that there really was a Madame Butterfly. She was a geisha from Nagasaki who, well, I'll say that story for the first intermission. Right now, the stage is set, the conductor is about to take the podium, and the singers are making their final preparations. <clears throat> me, 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 me. Oh, wait, I don't have to sing tonight. I get to sit out and watch. Madame Butterfly is about to begin. The New York City Opera Orchestra, tuned and ready. Our performers are just off stage. Susan Graham mentioned that Madama Butterfly takes place in Nagasaki. She'll tell us more about the city of Nagasaki and its relationship with this opera during our first intermission. <laughs> New York City Opera music director George Manahan is our conductor this evening. Act One of Madama Butterfly by Puccini. Che 
che della vostra sposa tu già serva amorosa la cuoca il servito son confusi del grande onore i nomi su con la leggera raggio di sol nascente esala
It's time for our first intermission here at the New York State Theater. We'll be visiting with our two principals later on, but right now, our host, American mezzo-soprano Susan Graham, is backstage talking with the director of this production of Madama Butterfly, Mark Lemos. Let's join them. Hi, Mark. I'm so happy to see you, and it's such a thrill for me to be here and see this fantastically beautiful production of Madame Butterfly. Thank you, Susan. It's great to be with you again. Well, thanks. We haven't seen each other since The Great Gatsby a few years ago at the That's Metropolitan right. Opera. That's right. And I'm remembering, as I'm, as I'm observing this beautiful set, that even in The Great Gatsby, you know, we had a really sort of open feel to the sets. And I was wondering, if, is, this a, is this a particular trademark of yours? <laughs> well, with this, with this piece, Madame Butterfly, uh, the designer, Michael Jurgen and I decided to kind of open it up so that it was all about acting. And with Gatsby, it was more about the uh, sort of elusive quality of Gatsby's life. So the space there and the openness of it on the Met stage was really more about the, the psychology of that uh, mm. elusive character. Mm. And in this production, I think that it seems as though you've stripped us of pagodas and, you know, very ornate sets in order to really focus on the interaction between these two really pivotal characters. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I'm a theater director, you know, and I started out as an actor. So the, when I first began to listen to Butterfly and look at the libretto, I really thought of it as an acting piece. And, mm. you know, the great thing about Puccini, and I know you know this, but it's one of the thrilling things about his work. He was inspired by live theater. The Butterfly was a play he saw that David Belasco, an American director, directed. Mm -hmm. His Tosca is really based as much on Sarah Bernhardt's performance as Tosca Fantastic. than it is on anything by Sardou. So he was so into live theater that I feel what we're seeing in, in Butterfly and Tosca is Puccini's evocation of a so-called straight actress's version of these roles and he turns them into music. It's, it's a one-of-a-kind moment in music history, but it's, it's, it keeps his operas so theatrical and alive. Well, I was wondering, being a, such a, a prolific Broadway director as you are, and, and I was wondering if you were influenced by David Belasco's work and, and knowing that he, another very famous of his time Broadway director, um, presented a play that is responsible for us having this opera now because Puccini saw his play, of course, yeah. in London yeah. and decided to write an opera on it. Belasco was one of the visionaries of our theater and he really influenced world theater completely and he influenced film. I mean, I don't think... He took theater as far as it could go towards realism and then film took over. It was like painters just before the discovery of photography. Belasco took the theater to that place that became completely realistic. So this butterfly is based on realism and because there's so much realism in the moment to moment interchange of the performers, the, the characters, we felt we could open it up now for modern audiences so that you just concentrated on that. It's so heartbreaking as I was watching it from the wings I was seeing, you know, the development of the foreshadowing of the disasters that are to come. How as a director do you, do you bring those into the front, into the foreground for an audience to let them know that it's not all as rosy as it looks. Yes, well, part of it is in the, in the costume design. Constance Hoffman had this idea when we first did the production, and it's now about 11 years ago. She said, what if we based the whole color scheme of the production on, on, on the colors of the American flag? Red, I love the flags blue. in their hair. Yeah, <laughs> and I said, oh, that sounds interesting. And of course, this was before the Iraq War, it was before 9-11 mm -hmm. that this oh, production yeah. was created. And the flag meant something else then, to mm -hmm. be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll see the, the flag used in Act Two in another way. Uh, and I think Americans' reactions to the flag have changed and, and continue to change, rightly so, mm -hmm. because of history, because of what happens, because of events. But the initial moment of this production was really about Butterfly's love of, of things American and that tender uh, sweetness that she, that she has about, you know, who, who this country is was really what informed a lot of her character. Now that has, that's perceived in a different way by audiences. It's interesting. 
Well, it just goes to show us that opera is timeless, and, and how we react to it is all about our perspective and what's going on in the world at any given time, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. It's, it's why there are always new productions of these great masterpieces, because they'll always tell us something not only about the piece itself, but about our own time and about our own responses to the world. And that's always, what's great about Butterfly. They always have something new to say, don't they? They really do. Well, thank you so much, Mark. It's been such a thrill to see you, and I'm so excited about this production. Thank you, Thanks. Susan. A hundred years ago, Nagasaki was Japan's gateway to the rest of the world, and the city's thriving foreign community was a conduit for all that was exotic and mysterious about this unknown country. If not for them, we may never have heard of Chocho-san or Pinkerton, but was Madame Butterfly really a fictional character? Susan Graham looks at a beautiful city and its most famous inhabitants. There really was a Madame Butterfly, and she lived in Nagasaki, and she married a foreigner, and she had a son named Trouble, and her real story is almost as tragic as the opera. Her real name was Kagamaki, but she was a geisha who worked in a local Nagasaki tea house around 1870. Her geisha name was Chosan, or Butterfly. Her city, Nagasaki, is known for the atomic bomb in 1945, but both the bomb and Nagasaki figure in her story, and there is no other place in the world where this could have happened. Nagasaki at that time was Japan's main trading port, and there was a neighborhood of Europeans living there in more or less Western houses. What were all those foreigners doing in Nagasaki? Well, if you were a businessman and wanted to sell your widgets to Japan, Nagasaki was where the emperor said you had to go. Naturally, there was a great deal of interaction between visiting sailors like Pinkerton and the geishas. There were three Scottish brothers, the Glovers, Thomas, Alex, and Alfred, who were hugely successful not only helping to start Mitsubishi, but also Kirin Beer, among other things. One of the Glover brothers, we're not sure which, sort of married the real Madame Butterfly in the way they did then, temporarily and for an exchange of a hundred yen, or as they said, twenty Mexican dollars. According to the custom, the temporary marriage, a sort of rent-a-wife, could be ended by the so-called husband at any time. But here's the fascinating part. In some ways, the real story of Madame Butterfly paralleled the dramatic story created for the play and the opera from the original book by John Luther Long after the fact. In the stage versions of the story, Butterfly falls in love with the philandering sailor Pinkerton and they have a son named Trouble. When Pinkerton returns with his wife, Butterfly commits suicide in the presence of her son. What actually happened is that after the real Butterfly gave birth to her son in 1870, she was abandoned by her sort of husband Glover who went home to Scotland and the son was adopted by his sort of uncle Tom Glover and given the name Tomosiburo, which was shortened to Tom, so he became another Tom Glover. He came to America to study at the University of Pennsylvania in about 1890 and then returned to Nagasaki. Meanwhile, the real butterfly married a Japanese man divorced, and then came back to settle in Nagasaki, where she died in 1906. Tom Glover fell in love with and married a woman who made him happy, and he followed in the family tradition by starting the country's first steamship trawler fishing industry in 1918. Then came World War II. Tom and his wife, Waka, were forced to sell the magnificent Glover house because it overlooked the Mitsubishi shipbuilding area. Because both Tom and his wife were children of mixed Japanese-Western marriages, the Japanese military authorities were suspicious. Tom and his wife had to move down the hill. The house was very nice, but it was no Glover Mansion. Tom and Waka spent the war being followed and spied upon because they were of mixed ancestry. Waka died in 1943, and Tom was inconsolable. And just as his own Japanese government didn't trust his Scottish ancestry, he knew at the end of the war in 1945 that the new occupiers would regard anyone with Japanese blood as suspect for a long time to come. 
or worse, that they would ask him to take sides. The uncanny parallel with real life is that the son, who is promised in the opera that his name will be changed from trouble to joy, and who never saw his real mother again, couldn't avoid the trouble that seemed his fate. Seventeen days after the atomic bomb fell on Nagasaki in 1945, Tom Glover hanged himself. His suicide somehow brings the opera back to the real world. No, it's not the opera that Puccini wrote. But we come to the theater because sometimes, in ways big and small, life really does imitate art. We're about halfway through our first intermission in tonight's broadcast of Madama Butterfly from the New York City Opera. In the second intermission, we'll get a chance to meet our Chocho-san, soprano Shu Ying Li. Right now, our Pinkerton, James Valenti, is talking with Susan Graham. Well, I can't resist the temptation. I've wanted to say it my whole life. Hi, sailor. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a thrill to meet you and to, and to hear you sing this, this wonderful, wonderful role of Pinkerton. Thanks. But, you know, here you are, dressed to the nines, looking like a million bucks, a very tall, handsome tenor. <laughs> and believe me, folks, in this world, those are rare. Um, and I'm being honest because I'm a tall mezzo, and we can't find those tall tenors very easily. But, you know, here you are, <laughs> and you're singing one of the biggest cads in all of opera. Mm, true. Poor Pinkerton. I mean, he, you know, he's a love him and leave him kind of guy. How do you reconcile being obviously a nice guy and singing a character like this? Well, you know, it's fun sometimes to be the bad guy. And uh, I try to, to make him as sympathetic and uh, especially in the third act, as remorseful as possible. So to not make him quite so loathsome and despising, you know. But uh, it's, it's fun to be the bad guy, actually, sometimes, and to play the sort of ugly American and kind of make fun of everybody, and it's, it's sort of fun. Well, it's very I, different from myself, so. You know, how much of the kind of posture and physicality that, you know, you have such a commanding presence on oh, the stage, you. how how do you use that to achieve these goals with your character? Well, I mean, as you said, I'm quite tall, so I really just try to just stand quite erect and be very, you know, proud and, and uh, you know, just sort of try to tower over everybody, all the, you know, the Asian people, and... Uh, um, just try to just take take charge of the stage and uh, you know have this great music that helps me uh, to do that. So that's fantastic because you know part of the the difficulty I would think is that you're singing these very lyrical tunes and mm -hmm. and isn't it isn't it difficult not to really get sucked into the love story? I mean, do you think that Pinkerton has a real love for Butterfly at the yeah. beginning? Uh, at, the be at, at the very very beginning, he's sort of infatuated and, and fascinated with her. I think by the time that the actual love duet comes around at the end of the act. He does start to sort of have these 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 real feelings for her, and really cares for her. And uh, in that moment, he is sort of in love with her. I think. Do you think he's just sort of swept away by the moment, or I mean, yeah, could he yeah. really be imagining a, a life? Uh, with, no, I don't think. Yeah. I think he's not thinking that far ahead. He's thinking, live in the now. He's got this this, this fascinating, beautiful girl in front of him, and uh, he's really he really is. Uh, in this, in this moment, swept away in the moment, as mm -hmm. you said. Because in the beginning, in your first big scene, you know, when Sharpless is singing to you. And, yeah, I'm and talking you, about the American wife. I'm gonna exactly, have some and you have right. this sort of look of kind of like, huh, well. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. And he talks about, I heard her speak of love, and I'm like, come on, love, this is not love. This is just, you know, this is just for today, you know. She may not be Miss Wright, but she's Miss Wright she's now. She's Miss Wright now, exactly. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How does it feel to be on a, on a set that's so open like that? It presents challenges because uh, there isn't much there. So we really, it, the focus is really on us as the actors, and uh, we just have to do our best to make the, make the use of the minimalistic set and, uh, you know, try to, our best to just make, what, make do with what we have. But uh, it presents challenges. We have a big staircase and a couple doors, and... Uh, that's about it. So. Well, I know how it can feel to be on a wide open stage where there's yeah. not, all the focus is on you, but believe me, the camera comes in to close in and, and oh, all the focus is on the two of you, and it's really good. beautiful. And great. it's been a pleasure talking with you. You too. Best of luck for the rest of the opera. Thank you. Honey. Thank you. Bye -bye. A couple of years ago, our own Beverly Sills told us a story about Giacomo Puccini and his non musical interests. In addition to composing operas like Madama Butterfly and Tosca, Signor Puccini was something of an outdoorsman and a sharp bargainer to boot. Here's Beverly to give us the scoop. Giacomo Puccini loved guy things. Fine guns, fast cars, fast boats, fast women. Well, actually, let's leave out the women for now. 
You wouldn't think that a man who could write an opera for the Metropolitan like Franchula del West would be enamored of speedboats, but he was. His home, after all, was at Torre del Lago in Italy, and he loved to whiz around the lake to impress his friends and his women. Well, his friends. At the Met, his opera Franchula was such a success that Puccini got not only 55 curtain calls, a record, but $22,000 just for the royalties on just that first performance with a lot more to come. So it was odd that one day during rehearsals, he was walking down Fifth Avenue and saw a fabulous speedboat in a store window. Uh, those were the days. And fell in love with it until he found that it cost $3,000 and passed it by. What was odd was that rich and famous as he was, he was still the thrifty Tuscan homeowner who could easily have bought the speedboat from just his first night's earnings. But in genuine fairy tale operatic fashion, his dream came true a few nights later when he was at a dinner in the Vanderbilt mansion. A wealthy banker said to Puccini that his favorite aria was Busetta's Waltz from La Boheme. Would you write it out for me, said the banker? I'll pay any price. Any price, said Puccini unbelievingly. Any price, said the banker. Well, how about $3,000, said Puccini. Done, said the banker. So the banker got his manuscript waltz for Musetta, and Puccini got his speedy speedboat, which he delivered to his gorgeous Italian lake, and raced around really impressing his friends. Puccini would trade notes for boats anytime. Intermission is drawing to a close here at the New York State Theater. We'll be right back for Act Two of Puccini's Madama Butterfly at the New York City Opera after this short pause. When we left Chocho san and Pinkerton at the end of Act One, they were together but with very different visions of the future. The curtain is about to come up on Act Two. Three years have gone by. And their situation has changed dramatically. Conductor George Manahan, coming back to the podium here at New York City Opera for Act Two of Madama Butterfly, live from Lincoln Center.
As the town of Nagasaki sleeps below, Chocho-san stands watch and waits for Pinkerton. The humming chorus drawing down the curtain on Act Two of Puccini's Madama Butterfly. Act Three on the way in just a few minutes, coming to you live from Lincoln Center, a production at the New York State Theater from New York City Opera. Xu Ying Li as Chocho-san and a star turn for Tyler Christopher Backer, six years old, playing the son of Chocho-san and Pinkerton. Young Tyler Christopher Backer told the New York Times recently that the fav his favorite part of the show is when he gets to run under the silk, which we saw just a few minutes ago during Puccini's famous flower duet. And he knows he's on TV tonight. He said, I think a lot of my friends from school will watch me on TV. You're watching live from Lincoln Center. It's Puccini's Madama Butterfly coming to you from the New York City Opera. Puccini's opera based on a play by David Belasco, and in just a moment, we'll learn more about David Belasco. But let's begin this intermission by meeting the singer behind our Chocho cho san Susan Graham is once again backstage, and Xu Ying Li is going to join her for a few minutes before she prepares for the climactic third act of Madama Butterfly. Xu Ying, you've just come off stage after an amazing act of Madame Butterfly. How do you feel? Are you exhausted? Are you energized? Are you? I am. I, I can't say exhausted. I still, still have another act to go. That's true. So I'm still <laughs> excited. So until the last, I think. The yeah. emotion is so high. Oh yes. The scenes that you just did. I saw when you were. I'm, I'm almost teary-eyed just thinking about it. When you realized that the ship had arrived and that he was coming back, the way that you handled that scene and running up stage with your hands over your face was just so brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you feel really wrapped up in the character at this moment? Is this I a do. real emotion for you? I do. I do. I thought I really saw the ship coming. We saw that. Yeah, and I saw the excitement, you know, I, finally he's coming back to me. We yeah. see that in your, in your performance. You've performed Madame Butterfly many, many times, haven't you? Yes, yes. This is my, like, about 20 productions already. Really? Yes. And all over the world, haven't you? Uh, most time in America, yes. but I wish looking forward to seeing more in Europe and China also. Yeah. I heard that you had a big success with this role in Japan. Yes, yes. We went to Japan. Uh, that's my debut with New York City Opera. We went there for the 
tour mm -hmm. and we had phenomenal success there with all the Japanese audience. That must have which been is, so, so exciting. So, so, yes, yes. Well, you know, opera has always been such an international art form and these days we have no geographical boundaries. You know, singers like us from all over the world yeah. travel to sing everything. Yes. But even over a hundred years ago, Puccini, an Italian composer, yes. was writing an opera about a Japanese girl mm -hmm. in love with an American sailor. Yeah. And you're a Chinese soprano bringing this character to life. Tell me a little bit about your background and how when you were growing up in China and how you feel that this makes you able to understand Cho Cho San or relate to her. Oh yeah, um, I, I grew up in China mm -hmm. and uh, I was educated in China also. I studied music there, but when I, uh, I studied opera when I came to New York City, so at Manus College of Music. In the so, culture that you grew yeah. up in, yeah. do you think that there are any similarities between your, your experience as a young girl and the way that, that you love and the way that Cho Cho San yes. is raised. And tell yes. me about that. My grandparents, they all tell me, like, find some husband, believe, be, make sure that you love each other, you make sure you love forever. And, you know, just uh, I was taught when I was a child, like, uh, you have to really stay and work harder with the, the people who you love with, mm -hmm. and you can never change. No matter how hard it's going to be, you have to work harder for the relationship. So I think Cha Cha San is sort of like uh, she's uh, living for love and die for love also. <laughs> you know, she believes, believes very strongly in this. Doesn't yeah, she? like internal love in, in her life, of course. And from the beginning of the opera, when you come up over the over the rise and you see this husband. Yeah. that you're going to, this future husband. Mm -hmm. how, are, how, how does that begin your journey as the artist, as the singer, knowing that you've got this long journey in front of you that doesn't end so well? <laughs> but at the beginning, how, what are you thinking? Um, I never, first of all, when I, before I went on stage, I do not think in the end. I was thinking about this in my life is beginning. My, my sweet love just, just started. My life beautiful life just started. I'm go on my, on my wedding. I believe this is my wedding day, which is I never thought, I never want to think about the end. That's the end, you know, the story. Exactly. Of course I know, but I try to avoid thinking about it. Well, we stay in the yeah. moment, don't we? We yes. just try, try and live that one moment Definitely. That we're in, don't we? Definitely. Now, yeah. as, as the last act is approaching, mm. are you already starting to think about that end of the journey? Um, when you know, it, it, it doesn't end well, but, but you're in a, in a position now where you're waiting for your husband to return. Mm -hmm. And you've sung this incredible music and it, that just carries you along. But now that you're about to do the, la the final scenes, yes. how do you feel going into those? Just follow what I feel. What's the story feel? What's the Cha Cha San's life going to be? I just follow the music. What the music gave to me, I'm going to do what the music gave to me. It's yeah. very clear that this music affects yeah. you deeply yeah. because you affect us deeply. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and it's a, it's a beautiful performance and we wish you all the best for the end of the Thank you the so opera. much. Thank pleasure. you. Pleasure. Yeah. Great pleasure, though. It may be difficult for some of us to imagine a time without widespread recorded sound and moving images. Nevertheless, live stage drama was once the most popular form of mass entertainment. Before Spielberg, before Motown, Nashville, and rock and roll, before Cecil B. DeMille, there was David Belasco. How did Puccini net Madame Butterfly? Well, he was always on the lookout for new opera ideas. There are stories that he got some of them from his rivals, snatching Bohème from Leon Cavallo, which is why there are two Bohèmes, and constantly interested in what Massenet was pursuing among the best sellers of the time. But how to top his own Bohème and Tosca? Well, Puccini.